Good morning, everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around our presentation room. Please note that we have now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are now being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a list of participants. If you run into any technical issues during the presentation, hover your mouse over my name, Dan Wilton, and a menu will appear to send me a private chat message. Below the participant list is the chat area. The chat is public and is recorded. Here you can post your responses to anything that might come up during the presentation. It's also an opportunity for the microphone shy to post questions to our presenter at the end of the talk. The main window is the projection screen for the slides, and above that you'll find a button showing the person with a raised hand. That's a pull-down menu for making the session more interactive, with options for a smiley or applause. After the presentation, we'll release the microphone for questions. To use your microphone, click the microphone button next to the little man wants to begin speaking and again to disconnect when you've finished your question. Do remember to keep your microphone off when you're not speaking to avoid any feedback or background noises. And here we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a special edition in the 2017 CIDR session series from the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning and the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University. As Canada's open university, Athabasca has always been a strong proponent for openness in education, beginning with open access and now with the growing realization of the importance of open data and open educational resources in learning. In recent years, as many of you will have seen, we have also been expanding our work both teaching and research into the K-12 world, including our most recent session on the state of the nation in K-12 e-learning in Canada with Michael Barbour and Randy Labonte, and of course, the BOLT program, Blended and Online Learning and Teaching. Today's session brings both these streams together, openness and open educational resources with K-12 learning, with the launch of a new project sponsored by Alberta Open Educational Resources, called Multiply K-12 Open Educational Resources, a series of podcasts and videos for in-service K-12 teachers. Our guests today are the two architects of this project, Dr. Connie Blomgren and Verena Roberts. Dr. Blomgren is an assistant professor in the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University. As the project lead for the BOLT initiative, she oversaw the redesign of graduate courses into professional learning modules for K-12 teachers. Her own background is steeped in K-12, having taught in public schools for 25 years in everything from grade three to grade 12. Verena Roberts is a technology for learning specialist with Rocky View Schools and is a K-12 educator, consultant, Michigan Virtual Research Institute fellow and doctoral student at the Workland School of Education at the University of Calgary. She has consulted with organizations such as Mozilla and Canny Learn, and is the recipient of the 2013 Ina Cole Innovative Online and Blended Learning Practice Award. We also have at least one audience member with us who is involved with the project on the other side of the interviewer's microphone, Randy Labonte and hopefully he will be able to hear his perspective as well when we open things up to a general discussion. Before I hand things over to today's guests, just a quick announcement of our next CIDR session on April 19th with Dr. Gerald Ardito speaking on self-directed learning in blended learning settings. We'll follow that up a week later on April 26th with a session featuring Drs. Randy Garrison, Marty Cleveland Innes, and Norm Vaughn with their latest work building a community for the community of inquiry. We're just finalizing, finalizing the details on those, and you'll find more information posted soon on our site at cider.athabascau.ca. You'll also find these slides and a recording of this session at our site in about two hours. I'm now passing the microphone to Connie Blomgren and Verena Roberts. Feel free to use your applause buttons here. Everyone, welcome Connie Blomgren and Verena Roberts. Okay, go ahead, Connie. You should be able to use the microphone now. Sorry, Dan. Okay, there I am. Pardon me. I didn't click. 
Um, thank you so much for attending today, everyone. It's very exciting to be here. Um, Verena and I talked about the format, and we decided that we will be taking questions at the end. And if you do have a question, please type it into the chat, bo chat box, and we will um, attend to them at the end, however. Uh, we plan to go through quite a lot of information fairly quickly at the beginning and then have some opportunity to look at uh, a short video clip and a short audio clip from one of the podcasts. So we have quite a bit of content to get through today and we hope that you're able to enjoy it as much as we did in creating it. Um, perhaps uh, we don't... Uh, are, are not aware but today it's open education week and so when we selected this date we didn't really pay attention to that and then we had notification so that's a nice synchronicity so I'm just going to give you a little bit of background around um, how we actually even got to this idea of making these videos and podcasts um, as the introduction indicated I was involved heavily in the redesign of three graduate courses for the blended and online learning and teaching um, certificates program that we are offering through Athabasca University and our partnership with Alberta Distance Learning Center. And so we um, were in that process of redesigning these graduate courses and you can find more information about that uh, learning opportunity. Um, I think Dan has, will be putting up the URL in the chat box. But at the same time, there was also a call from ABOER um, to uh, produce some open educational resources if possible. And so uh, the need for open educational resources and, oops, pardon me, I forgot. I'll go back there. Uh, the, so I'll talk about the open educational resources in a minute here. Um, the ABOER call for funding came around and um, I put in uh, an application. In part it was because when I was finding um, up-to-date information for uh, Bolt 676 OER and systems thinking, I found that there was a emptiness of support material for K-12 teachers around um, understanding deeply what are OER, how do we use them, and what are their implications for our teaching and our learning. So I was given a grant and I was the project lead, Verena Roberts, our subject matter expert, and she brought in a whole wealth of excellent um, professional learning networks and um, various connections that made the project so much stronger. Dan Wilton was our project assistant. Lavina, Lavina Ewan, uh, Gloria Richardson were in their different support positions there. Gloria did an excellent job of keeping us focused. Uh, the media production team, they were very professional and fun to work with. And then right from the very beginning we were considering how to have universal design for learning principles in the podcast and videos. And so we consulted with Carrie Anton from AU to make sure that we were keeping those principles in, the, in our minds as we were creating. So um, the uh, history of OER and professional learning, OER has a strong connection to higher education. But OER in K-12 um, within a provincial Alberta focus or a national focus, um, this is what I mean, is that when I went to try and find resources to help um, populate the, uh, the curriculum redesign of Bolt 676, I found that, that it was very difficult to find uh, content to support teachers in understanding what are OER. And it's not just making them, it's about why would you bother spending that time and what are the benefits. So, of course, OER in the U.S. has gone quite uh, strongly, especially with their Go Open uh, initiative through the um, Department of Education in the U.S. And then, of course, internationally, OER is part of UNESCO and many other um, people who are interested about the equity of education. So ABOER um, is a uh, organization, well it's not really an organization, it's not correct to call it that. Um, 
In 2013, Alberta's Ministry of Advanced Education entered an MOU with both British Columbia and Saskatchewan to collaborate on the development of common open education resources for higher education. And they had funding to uh, support OER awareness, use, and championing became available. So through this um, opportunity, this is where um, I was able to apply for the grant and uh, work through and create these supports for teachers. So here's the definition by UNESCO and I believe uh, and then also the five R's of OER which many of the people in the audience today are probably familiar with and I'm now going to hand the mic over to Verena. So I think she's coming here. Sure, Verena, if you're looking for the microphone, it's in the top bar. It looks like an old fashioned microphone and uh, you click it once, it'll turn green and you can begin speaking. Okay, she says it's not there. So while she's finding it, I will just continue on. I don't want to have uh, us uh, pausing here. And sometimes these things happen with technology. Uh, I think she's uh, requesting to go back to the original mics. Yes, Stephen, yay technology. It's always part of the picture. So Dan, do you want to just go then? We'll um, alternate mics, I guess. All right, so Verena, if you are not seeing a microphone at this point, I will work with you in the background and we will get the microphone up for you in the meantime. So uh, if you see the microphone now, grab it. Otherwise, um, we'll return to Connie. Okay, uh, we are having a little technical issue here with the microphones. Uh, Connie, if you are speaking, we cannot hear you. I'm going to release the microphone to you in a moment, and you can grab the microphone and be ready to go. Okay, my apologies. I think we will just go back. Um, I was talking here. Okay, sorry, my apologies. As Stephen says, you gotta love the technology. Beautiful when it works and not so much when it doesn't. So we wanted to make sure that we collected the voices and perspectives of K-12 teachers. And with that, um, we wanted to make sure that it was real and that was visible and that it was for as many educators as possible. We had a very short timeline. We only had um, six months, essentially, to go from uh, assembling the team, uh, figuring out what we were going to cover, re um, interviewing all these different people, and then assembling it either in a video or th the podcast. And we decided to go with podcasts uh, in, for a couple of reasons. One was that there was um, accessibility is greater when there's connectivity issues. So when we're talking about people in the north or in rural parts of Alberta or Saskatchewan or wherever, podcasts may be more accessible. Um, also, the cost of video is just higher. So we thought, let's maximize what we can do. So with Verena's help, uh, we created an online survey to use design-based teaching 
to collect ideas around what topics would best benefit teachers in these podcasts and videos. So here's just a, a sample of the online survey that we had. We only ran it for a week. We had over 50 responses, so it was very exciting to have the support. Then we took that information and we decided to call them sort of a topic such as history of OER and break it down into some subtopics and then we had some guiding or essential questions that we wanted each podcast to answer. The project con contributors you can see here a long list of very well noted OER um, scholars within Canada, the United States and beyond. Many of these connections were brought in by Verena's um, experience and long work in working with OER in different locations with different people. And so it was very exciting to just have this variety of support and it was very well, um, it was just exciting to just have so much great support from everyone. So then we moved into um, the recording process and we had to figure out the questions and have a matrix of which podcast the possible questions for each of the interviews could be um, organized. And so uh, this took a little bit of time and organization and we went from what we thought were the easiest uh, podcasts to create to the more challenging ones. And then from the podcast creation, we moved into um, some of the um, transcription, I shouldn't say some, all of the trans transcription of the various interviews. And interviews were ranging from about 45 minutes to an hour and 20 minutes. And so it took quite a while to tr uh, transcribe all the um, interviews. And these were done either in a studio, but many of them were done over the telephone and recorded. And um, we then had um, the process of writing the scripts and figuring out how were, we, how were we going to basically cut and paste all this content that we had on the various topics and assemble it into podcasts that range in length from about, I think the shortest is maybe five or six minutes to about 12. So it was never about the length of the podcast or video, it was always driven by how can we best represent the content that we want in this particular um, podcast or video. So the, um, part of the uh, grant money was to um, assemble some teachers, practitioners in the classroom, K-12, to and record them. And so we did research uh, about what we would want to have in our workshop as we decided that we would have a day-long workshop and that we would have pre and post videos that would interview these teacher partition, uh, practitioners and we would film it and we would have a process throughout to uh, help us understand uh, the awareness use and the idea of advocacy of OER for K-12 teachers and essentially exploring some of the wicked problems of OER. Um, the workshop itself was based on the uh, work of Royce Kimmons where he did some research of teachers who evaluated some textbooks and some of those were uh, textbooks that were um, traditional uh, copyright restricted textbooks, open uh, uh, access textbooks and then open adapted. And so taking his research from 2015, we used some of his uh, research to guide our workshop. And then additionally, um, through the work that Verena has done with Rhonda Jensen, uh, who I believe she's probably attending here today, um, we um, also came up with this workshop agenda of finding and using it and um, how can we um, take these different resources from different presentations that Verena and Rhonda have held at teacher conventions and other conferences and reshaped it or remixed it for our purposes of the um, video recording. 
So of course, part of what was inspiring us was this idea of what is openness and open pedagogy. Now, when we got to the videos, um, it was even more of a challenge of how are we going to assemble all this content and make sense of it for our viewers and also not have it overwhelming or pedantic or going on for too long. And so we decided that perhaps what the best thing would be would be to uh, take the open pedagogy model from Bronwyn Hegarty and apply it to um, the videos and the content that we were finding. And so we broke up the videos into two parts. Uh, the first one is the f first four attributes of participatory technology, trust, innovation and creativity, and connected community. So those first four attributes are in the first video. The last four attributes of sharing, uh, learner-generated, reflective practice, and peer review are in the second video. So just to break it up and to, again to sort of help people understand where all this content from the video interviews fit. Um, the uh, resources, the podcasts and videos are located here on the Bolt multi-author blog, which is an open uh, resource to the public. And uh, again, rather than hiding it behind um, the curriculum of a course that you have to be enrolled in to access, I felt that in the spirit of openness, um, having it located here on the Bolt multi-author blog would be a way to make sure that it gets shared out and used. The videos, okay, uh, I see um, Verena wants to try here. We're going to just finish up the videos, Verena, and then we'll go into um, the podcast and hopefully her mic will work then. So here in the end we created three videos only. And the first two are the ones that uh, show the attributes. And then the third video talks about Alberta um, perspectives from K-12 practitioners. And um, they all run, I think, around 12 minutes, something like that, um, at the most. And um, we are ready to have a short clip of one of the videos. I think it's the first video. So Dan's going to take over here and switch on the video for me. I, I do think that that idea of creating resources as and using the open education resources is so exciting because for so long, you know, you have that vetted resource and, and people have used that as if it's the program of studies even though we know as educators that it's not and we're not supposed to do that. I think it's, it has become really easy over time for people to do that and I love the idea of moving away from that just to really reaffirm as professionals that it's not the textbook that we're teaching, it's the program of studies. So then, so to really look at that program of studies and say okay well yeah I might use this from the textbook and but there's all these other resources out there that actually enhance the program of studies better or more completely or a mix of them. So I think to what you were saying about the curation, it's, it's exciting. It's time consuming, but it's exciting. So that's um, Lisa, one of our participants in our video um, recording. Jason Wicks is also um, a participant and I see that Jake's, Jason is here today so hopefully he will be able to give us some comment about how he um, experienced the workshop and his, ex his perspective as being a video participant. So I believe Verena's microphone is now working so I'm going to pass it over to you Verena. Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, oh, perfect. Okay, so the podcast, um, uh, I was frantically trying to fix tech in the background, so forgive me if I've repeated myself. Um, when we figured out what our, um, our topics were, the exciting thing about this project was we were literally modeling what oh, the potential of open educational resources and the fact that we could remix 
um, the content and the podcast. So you will see if we start at the beginning, the welcome is obviously just Connie and Marina. And then for the history of OER, we have a variety of contributors like TJ Bliss and Randy Labonte, Rory McGreal, David Porter, and Sarah Weston, who came from different perspectives. We have everything coming from a teacher's perspective all the way to our UNESCO um, advisor, um, as well as Hewlett Foundation, um, contributors. Um, so part of this project is all about modeling what uh, we could do with OER as well because when we talked to the teachers originally a they didn't really have a firm idea of what open educational resources were but they were working in the open and they did have lots of ideas about what that would look like we then had topics like the current landscape of OER which we took from a perspective an international perspective as well as a Canadian Alberta perspective benefits for OER for K-12 learning and acceptance of OER in K-12 education. That one in particular talked about some of the barriers and some of the tricky situations that teachers, educators, and policymakers have had to deal with when trying to implement OER. So if we go to the next slide. Um, oops, I clicked too much. Part two. Um, the learning with OER and the teaching with OER, as a, as a teacher right now and um, working as a specialist within a district, I honestly put the learning with OER and teaching with OER on in the background during the day because the words and the phrases and the ideas that come out of those two podcasts literally calm me down and fulfill me with great warm fuzzy thoughts. Um, I can't tell you how much meaning there is in those two podcasts in, in, in particular and how many great ways we can learn and teach with OER. The Openness and Open Mindset podcast challenges us to, to think about open as a mindset and as Stephen alluded to earlier, it's an open education week every week. And we have people like Bea, Royce, Randy, Rory, David Porter, and Michael um, give inspirational ideas about the potential for openness um, in learning today. Then, um, it's finally, I'll let Connie talk about the eight attributes of open pedagogy, the open pedagogy model, and next, the copyright. Go ahead, Connie. Okay, Verena. Yes, um, the eight attributes of open pedagogy, that is the interview that we did with Bronwyn Hegarty. And it overlaps with the videos because the heuristic that we used with the videos comes from her article. And what's really nice about uh, Bronwyn's model is that, as she said, from her perspective, participatory technologies are the, the cornerstone or key to all of this idea of um, open educational resources as something that not just teachers are creating and sharing, but that students have the potential to be adding content, um, providing review and feedback, and in the long term, they are the ones who use the materials but also can create and contribute through the participatory technologies. So um, her heuristic was really helpful. And so the um, podcast of number four and five in this section is a useful explanation if someone is wanting to understand further, um, in addition, of course, to the article in which she originally published the model. So I'm passing the mic back. Thanks, Connie. And finally, one of the big questions we hear about a lot um, from the Go Open campaign in particular from the United States and also from the context of the higher education is creating policy for OER in Canada. And um, we weren't able to really find a lot of information on it per se because we there are not a lot of open policies in terms of K-12 OER in Canada. However, we were able to gain some insight into some perspectives about the possibilities for the future um, in Alberta and in Canada. So that's what you hear from the number one, creating policy for OER in Canada from experts across Canada. Um, and you'll see they're all Canadian in that context. Then we went and spoke with Jim Swanson, who actually, Stephen, we, this, the, the way I connected with uh, Jim was from our original panel years ago. Um, and he is a, 
a lawyer who gave us some incredible insights into copyright and user rights um, so that we could support our teachers across the province in understanding from a Canadian and Alberta perspective, um, what's going on, what the definitions are. And then in the bottom, what we did was um, I created, based on talking to some fellow teachers and some fellow OER um, advocates, some examples. Um, his name is Jim Swanson. Sorry, Jalen, it's right on there. Um, we created some context of examples of situations where teachers wouldn't know what to do in this situation. So um, we have learning management example, course sharing example. For example, in Alberta, we have uh, online courses that are kept um, in specific learning management systems and due to the copyright uh, for some of the content, they're not able to share those courses with others. And we talk about when you can and you can't legally. Now, remember that all of the podcasts from Jim Swanson, he does not, I just want to mention, he does not want to be taken in terms of their actual law and he does not want to be quoted word for word. These are only under advisement and um, he gives his opinion based on what the current context is in Alberta. Thanks, Jason. Um, as curriculum redesigns, this policy will be key. Yes, exactly, Jason. And I'm so glad that you said that this is really important in the direction of the future curriculum. And so that's why it's really great to see an environmental scan of the potential and what we can do. Oh, thanks, Tim, put in the LinkedIn um, to connect with Jim Swanson, who is an Athabasca University alumni and eager to connect and, and talk with people. Now we go to the podcasts and what they would look like. What we did was we used specific podcast software so that people could go in, remix, and use these podcasts in their own context and ways. And we also tried to model um, from a CC licensing perspective what it would look like. We also had to put CC licensing on. Um, we had to have it recorded on the podcast. And we wanted to make it as open as possible to the world. Connie, did you want to add anything more on the cre how we created the actual podcast and put them on? Uh, no, just other than <clears throat> right from the very beginning, we wanted to make sure that we were using universal design for learning principles and that we didn't add it in as an afterthought. And so Carrie Anton was really helpful in helping us just um, ensure that we were um, fulfilling all those uh, requirements. And I don't know whether you noticed, uh, but on the videos, you, there's closed captioning. So that's very nice. It's right there. It's built in. It allows people to access it. And as well, there's transcripts of all the podcasts and videos. And um, this allows people, if they want to, to just use the transcripts. Um, I see that potentially being used in uh, research papers and a sharing out of evidence-based practices in many respects. Um, the, the interesting thing for me, when you look at the remixes of all the different perspectives on OER and K-12, is that you do not get a focus on content, you get a focus on process, which I think is so valuable in the discussions around the potential of open learning and OER. And on that note, we're going to pass it over to Dan, and he's going to let us have a little listen of one of the podcasts. Dan? Rory McGrail, UNESCO Chairholder in Open Educational Resources at Athabasca University, agrees that a move towards open educational resources is not only beneficial, it is essential to the future of education. I believe, based on facts, based on more than 30 years of experience in developing learning objects and online resources and supporting them, that it is essential for us in education to move towards open educational resources. I believe that we cannot continue to work to share our material in a restrictive copyright environment. And uh, after all, uh, the first thing we teach in education is our, our children is how to share. 
and we need to promote the sharing of information. And I believe it's, it's not just a good thing to do, it is an essential thing to do. Thanks, Dan. So um, as uh, Stephen just asked, these are their real voices. We ended up interviewing people around the world, um, and that's what our design team helped us with. And then we remixed and created all those um, transcripts to pull in common themes and ideas. Um, now, this is the really interesting part. And for those of you who follow open learning and are open learners or advocates of open learning, just today, this is the number of different institutions that we know of, institutions, collaborations, associations, and actually, did I forget, Ro or Rocky View Schools, and, oh no, there as well, that have already had access to our open educational resources um, as of actually this moment and today. So there's the courses in which the content will be integrated. There's the blog, and my blog post is waiting to be posted. But then there's all the content that is on the blog. The ABRO website will have this content. Our Edmonton Regional Learning Consortium and in Alberta, um, we have learning consortiums across the province, um, and they will have uh, they will be adding all these resources. Rocky View Schools, we have the Moodle Hub and all these resources we added, the cyber webinar. And also important, what we learned in this project is like Athabasca University Library, we can add this content into our library and therefore it can be shared through metadata and it will be um, pulled up in different searches. That was fascinating to learn and so they asked for that content as well. The Go Open campaign yesterday, I was speaking with Christina Peters, the current uh, fellow with the Go Open campaign in Washington uh, in, uh, for the US. The Handbook of Research in K-12 Online and Blended Learning, we'll be using some of the learning from these resources in the 2017 edition. And then a list of servers, or uh, sorry, email lists that I participate in. And finally, Open Education Week. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what we've learned, and then um, we'll leave it open for questions. Connie? Yes, well, we're just getting to the very end here. Um, so to sum up, I would say that uh, it was a tremendous project. We worked very diligently. It was a lot of fun, and it was um, a great opportunity to have these connections with OER experts uh, from the classroom to scholars to talk about uh, the potentials for OER and as part of equity and the use of participatory technologies for teaching and learning. And uh, what I would say is that it contributes to the wise spending of public money. Sometimes you see about it saving money. I think it's really about the wise use of public money. And so I think there's just tremendous opportunities here. Uh, for myself personally, I planned to publish articles related to the project, continue with some K-12 OER research, and of course support K-12 awareness, use, and advocacy. Um, for me, I was fascinated um, with the, the, the idea that um, OER is a concept that isn't the words are almost um, creating a barrier or a challenge in some ways because it's something that is being done. It's resources that are being used, but the words confused people. Um, and so that taught me a lot about um, my next steps in, in the context of a researcher and as my own position within a, a, a district. Um, I'm thinking about how and why to share these resources and we're working on plans within our district right now to support uh, digital resources in a wide variety of ways. Talking about CC licensing is quite um, a hot topic, especially in our district. Um, the attributes of open pedagogy and the focus on process over product is probably the most meaningful thing that I have learned and um, thought about during this project, and that is going to actually lead into my doctorate work, which I will be working on with actually my advisor, Michelle Jacobson, who happens to be here um, in the future with uh, work on School of Education. So with that, I think we'll leave it for questions. Um, do we have any specific questions, Dan, that we need to answer, or are we leaving it open for questions? 
Okay, yes, we are opening to questions now. Uh, people are welcome to use their microphones um, to ask their questions. Click it once to turn it on, click it again to turn it off, or continue to use the chat box as you have been doing so far. Um, feel free to post your questions there. And uh, again, just a thank you to our presenters, Connie Blongren and Verena Roberts. Uh, it's been a, it's a great project to work on, and I encourage everyone to check out the videos and podcasts. Okay, so now we go to questions. Feel free to grab the microphone now. I see that um, uh, there's a couple of questions here in the chat box. One, Stephen. I, I don't believe the RSS feed has been turned on, but I've made a note about that, and I will ask Lavina to ensure that it is. And Kelly has a question here um, about, could you speak more about how teachers are encouraged to share OERs, and is there a specific platform where you're rec we're recommending a wiki, etc.? And then. Um, we also want to make sure that we uh, answer or have uh, Randy Labonte and Jason Wicks give their perspectives of participating in the project. So um, I'm going to hand the mic over to you, uh, Verena, and maybe you can answer that first question. We can go from there. Right, Kelly's one. Um, now the, the feed goes down, so maybe we need to repeat this. Like Kelly, could you speak more about the teachers are encouraged to share their OERs? Um, at this point, um, at Rock Haven Schools in particular, we're using an LMS called Moodle, and within that um, LMS, we are pulling together digital resources, like and and OERs, so licensed digital resources, as well as content that teachers have created which has some copyrighted it and not so therefore it has to be behind a password in our Moodle shell and open educational resources so we are sharing it behind our Moodle shell which does not necessarily make it open before Stephen points that out to me however it is open within our district <laughs> Um, on this, the, so the second part of that is we have created Storify collaborations and curations to try to pull together some ideas of OER that we can put out in the open. Um, so we, we have the open pedagogy aspect and that we're trying to collaborate and share and use our resources behind the LMS shell and then we also have um, open resources that we're sending out. So there's two ways in which we're doing that. And Jason might be able to speak to that a bit more. Jason, do you want to try your microphone anyway? Jason was one of the teachers who collaborated with us on the video recording. Hello? Can you hear yeah, me? There you go. Yeah. What would you like me to talk about? You mentioned that Black Gold is doing a great job. Could you uh, elaborate a bit on that? Well, they, have, they, have, they have a pretty open website and they took a whole bunch of AC money and they did a whole bunch of project-based learning and they put all those resources out on their website and anybody can use them and they update them and they curate them and they do a really good job of sharing. It's probably the best example I've seen of actual usable resources on a website that, you know, come down easy to come down in a format that you can edit and uh, it, it's really quite workable. Um, we also have Moodle Hub, and the Moodle Hub is not, the resources are not hidden behind a password, so they're just in Moodle and you can access them as well. Um, so they're another good example within Alberta. So either way, I think a learning management system really supports sharing of resources. Now, Connie, do you want to uh, help Jason, me? Jason, it's Connie here. Can you also speak a little bit about the process of the workshop? Uh, the workshop was fun to kind of get out of the day-to-day -day grind of running a large high school and kind of have, having a bit of time to think about how and what we do, especially around resources. I'm also teaching this year. I've got one section of grade 7 social and one two sections of grade 8 social. And so I'm constantly trying to do things well and do things better. And the workshop really kind of helped me think about those things and think about the resources and how we use resources. And it was, it was a good reflective process for me specifically. Um, and I, I learned quite a bit around
around what's been going on in the last couple of years. I worked at the Alberta Distance Learning Center for a long time. I've changed roles, so I haven't really been keeping up as much as I probably should. And so this was another really good learning opportunity to, to think about where, we, where we've gone from about three, four years ago to where we are now. And it's growing by small little increments. I think some of the same questions that we had four years ago are still around. Um, I'd be interested to see what the, the copyright lawyers had to say. I'm going to go listen to those podcasts here pretty quick um, and kind of how that relates to what actually happens on the ground in schools today. So it was really good to listen to the other participants as well and see how their divisions are dealing with some of those questions and seeing how some of their teachers are dealing with those questions. So it was, it was a really good day. I had a lot of fun and uh, I got to connect with some people that I haven't seen in a long time and it was it was a really good day of reflection and, and thinking about where we're going. Great, thanks so much Jason. And then can we also have Randy Labonte take the mic and talk about his perspective because we interviewed uh, Randy. Yeah, thanks. Um, it was a, a good opportunity uh, for me to reflect a little bit about OER. I've been on the periphery but more fascinated by looking at how OER uh, is being developed in the post-secondary and being able to compare that to K-12, to I think was one of the important takeaways that I had. And actually engaged with David Porter uh, just uh, last month in a conversation in the same boat about the differences. And the rationalization for <clears throat> open education resources in post-secondary uh, as a, was, was, in, was um, was interesting around the open textbook approach that the BC campus has fostered and now likely Ontario uh, will also follow with eCampus Ontario with, with uh, David there. Um, <clears throat> but um, universities tend to be autonomous, uh, a little less more so than, than school districts, which are more tightly controlled and regulated in the provinces uh, by the provincial ministries. So policy was an important part of uh, sort of the takeaway in those, in those discussions. So the process had me reflecting about my own views uh, and being sure that I was a little bit articulate, I guess, in terms of the interviews uh, to, to bring it forward. And I think it's important questions that the AUs pose and that this project has started to, to dig into. And Stephen, I look at some of your comments and others in here around open, and it really causes me to ask the question, what is truly open in the sense that um, whether it's, it's in a, an accessible location, is it searchable on an open internet? Um, and those are the, the, the struggles that I have in terms of looking at K-12 OERs. They tend to be inside silos or networks and they're very difficult to have them openly tagged and able to be reused or repurposed. So um, the project caused more questions than it provided uh, maybe answers in my mind as I went through it. Thanks, Randy. Um, I would agree with you on some of those points, and I, I think um, one of the big questions that came up here is, what are the differences between open learning, and is there like a continuum for K to 12, and what does that look like, and how can we expand upon that idea? But open educational resources themselves, the definition follows the five R's, and how do we support that in policy and implementation in our districts? Just going to go back to Vivian's question. Connie, can you please elaborate on this one because uh, you helped to develop those videos a little bit more and it was that how did we how did we integrate Hegarty's model and how did we come up with that as the way to go for modeling OEP, which is what we're talking about exact K-12 definitely went towards open pedagogy, open learning and not so much, it was much more process focused than content focused. So, Connie, do you want to elaborate on that? Okay, Connie can jump in in a sec, but I'll, I'll speak to it a bit, and then she can. Can you hear me now? Can you hear? Just checking. Anyone? Can they hear me? Yes. Uh, okay. Marina, you're, you're coming through fine. Okay, I'll just speak to Connie, and she can jump in. <laughs> she can get back. 
So um, we were delighted when we interviewed and worked with um, Bronwyn in New Zealand um, because we'd only read her article and we were so delighted that she was willing to participate in this project and we felt that her attributes of open pedagogy really represented or emulated what we were hearing um, across the world in terms of open education resources and open learning or how open education resources are used and implemented and accessed in K-12. So what Connie did um, in particular is she went through all of the different attributes and, and compared them to K-12 and then went through all of our recordings and took out examples of where those teachers gave examples of each of the attributes. So I would say it definitely followed, if I go back to Vivian's question, um, that's uh, what we did was we basically used the attributes and then we use the quotes to give examples of how we felt those attributes were reflected. I hope that that best answers that question. And then I just want to see before I answer Stephen's and Connie, if you can jump in, go ahead. Um, did I miss any other questions? I'm just trying to like go up and down. I missed a Stephen question here. Oh, uh, the challenges with ICT, well, at the beginning, the, the idea of using podcasts was so essential from a UDL point of view, universal design for learning, as well as differentiated learning, and the whole idea that we were trying to model what we're doing in the K-12 classrooms as well. Um, so some of the podcast issues were that the sound is not as wonderful for all of them. Um, I would say that was a, a challenge and then people, we wanted the people to be in their own site so we didn't want them to have to go to a studio necessarily and I think there's more potential for the future of podcast recording with our design teams. That was a little bit of a struggle for us. Can I use it in a, oops, where did it go, Stephen? It just, the MOOCs or link it, questions, music and further. Yeah. Um, I agree, Stephen. If the, the user is blocked in any way, it's not open. So um, when we're talking about resources in K-12, I definitely think that we have to have those conversations. And I know I have those conversations daily with my teachers about the differences even between sharing within Moodle and a learning management system and Google and, and how it restricts the sharing. Um, but the idea of sharing is maybe the biggest piece uh, the biggest learning in this whole project and how we can um, bring that mindset and encourage that mindset in K-12 communities and, and what does that look like. Connie, can you come in and add anything? Here. Oh, I agree. Google is proprietary and not open, but not all my teachers would necessarily agree. <laughs> um, okay. Some way in this Yes, some open education resources in Moodle and learning management systems in K-12 require login, and so therefore they are not considered open. Um, and I think that conversation about open pedagogy and open learning and how to support our learners in K-12 environments, and I mean the actual K-12 learners and not necessarily the teachers, um, is really important. And so sometimes we do have those walled gardens which are not considered open, but how do they encourage or scaffold open, open learning? That's going to be a conversation that I'm curious about. Yeah, hippocampus in the U.S. do require a login. Yes, Randy. So, what is truly open? Stephen, do you want to, or Randy, do you want to take the mic? Thank you. I just didn't want to presume. Um, I think these are important questions, but but to me, it's it's the exchange and the communication that is critical. So, Jason, I was struck by your comment about Black Gold does a good job. I think they do a good job because they communicated clearly to teachers, made it easy to access resources and possibly help them and organize it. So I found in K-12, you, you know, you can build it, but they won't come uh, no matter how you try to do that. Um, the question becomes one about how you manage that within your networks and how you share. So I see how consortiums are fitting that part for um, K-12. to So in Ontario, um, the Ontario uh, Catholic eLearning Consortium and the Ontario eLearning Consortium uh, do a great job of sharing content resources across and between boards 
then they use them individually and make them accessible to their teachers in their school districts to rationalize the same way that BC Learning Network is doing that uh, within its network group and the BCLN is, is now working with folks in Alberta and now in Saskatchewan as well. And again, it's a question of rationalizing and creating a vehicle to communicate. When BC Campus was doing its open textbook initiative, uh, I was first scratching my head going, well, they're writing a textbook? That's not OER. But it is open practices, open content that is available to uh, instructors and faculty members in a format and in a way in which they understand it and rationalize it. And it's an effective model and means of communicating uh, about those open resources. So I think those are, those are some of the things that rattle in my head about this and how best is it done. It's very jurisdictional, regional, and locally uh, derived. So the sharing will take many different formats. Uh, I Um, I think content, it, we're in an agreement that open educational resources follow the 5R. Um, but I agree, Jason, for teachers, what was most important was the remix, the ability for students to be able to access that content and remix it and tinker with it, and the attribution and how do we attribute back to the original source. Um, so, yeah, so agree, students, so maybe we... Need to call it something else. <laughs> there you go. Does anyone else have some comments on that? Because I agree, they are not. They're not all open. But the scaffolding for open pedagogy and participatory learning is essential in um, K to twelve learning environments. So that's a different topic as well. Um, the number one thing that did happen as well is we had no one talk about creating open textbooks. That was not important or a priority for any of our K-12 learners necessarily, um, or teachers or educators. It was about access to digital artifacts and being able to remix it and play with it and share it with others. Connie, okay, she went out. Is anyone else have anything they want to add? Thanks, Stephen. That's a very good point. Community educational resources. <laughs> well, now you're going to be quoted on it, Stephen. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, this will be an ongoing debate. But I think it's very important to have this debate, especially with the K-12s and especially with how we are collaborating and working on our resources. Hey, Dan. Oh, there's Connie. Does anyone else have anything? No more questions? Sure, I think uh, we can turn it over to Connie to see if her microphone is now working so that she can make uh, some final statements. Um, but uh, yes, we seem to have a strange wind coming out of Athabasca today that is interfering with people's microphones. So apologies to everyone for that. Um, we will check and see what's happening there. So Connie, if you can speak to us now, but go ahead and grab the microphone for some final comments as we wrap up the session. Thanks, Dan. Um, I appreciate everyone's um, attention this morning, and I'm hopeful that you will go and use those materials, uh, share them out. Um, I think that it's true that we've asked some questions through the creation of the podcasts and videos in that where is uh, OER for K-12? to And there's lots of questions here, more than we have any specific one right answer. So it was exciting to be part of it, and Verena was an excellent colleague to have us um, pull together all these resources. So thanks, thank you once again. All right, so a final thank you to our guests today, Connie Blomgren and Verena Roberts, and their uh, interesting project, a valuable project for K-12 in-service teachers, Multiply K-12 uh, OER. So that is available again uh, through the Bolt blog at bolt.athabascau.ca. And a reminder to our audience, thank you for attending our so these slides are available at our site, cider.athabascu.ca, and the full recording of this session will be available in about an hour. 
And with that, we bring this formal session to a close and the contact information for our two guests is available on the screen. I'm sure they would appreciate any uh, feedback you want to provide them or continue the conversation through email or Twitter. And thank you.